Thank you, Venerable, for your teaching. I have two questions. I Google online and was su surprised to find a monk who claims to be a living Buddha. How do you feel about such a claim? Is it legitimate? That's the first question. Uh, living Buddha. Well, um, let's look at it from two sides. The first is to find out why he said that, why he said he's a living Buddha. That's one approach to it. The second approach is, who cares? Why, why do you have to care? Why do you want to, why do you want to investigate into somebody else, um, what he said? If you investigate and think about everything that anyone said, you'll be busy, very busy for the rest of your life. Does it really affect you? So who cares? But let's take the first approach. Why did he say he's a living Buddha? Well, there are, particularly with Tibetan Buddhism, they believe that when, when a high-level monk in other words, when a very uh, respectable monk, a monk who practices all the time, when, he, when he's on the verge of dying, when he's going to pass away from this world, he always uh, called his disciples together and said, well, uh, after I passed away, uh, I will reincarnate into a body who is in New York, for example, in New York, a uh, certain area, go and find me. Go and find me in New York. And then the disciples would really want to find him. So after a few years, they, went, they, they, they heard stories about New York. There was a boy in New York who was able to chant in Tibetan, and nobody taught him Tibetan. And there was a boy in New, in New York who was six, who, was, who didn't want to eat any meat since birth. And whenever that boy saw a monk, he felt very happy. He, he always felt that he wants to be a monk. And nobody taught him to be a monk. Nobody said to him to be a monk is good, but he always wanted to become a monk. He always wanted to be a vegetarian. He wa always wa he's always very compassionate. And uh, whenever he, um, he saw, for example, Tibetan languages, he got very familiar with it. And then the disciple heard stories about this, and they fly to New York to meet the boy. I'm just giving you an example. It's nothing, it's not a, a, true, story, it's a true story. I'm just giving an example. Then the, 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 the disciples, the monk, his followers, the, the, the monk who passed away, the followers of the monks who passed away, fly to New York to meet this boy. And when the boy saw these monks, the boy was so happy. The boy felt as if these monks were long-time friends to them. And he wanted to follow these monks back to Tibet. But the monk said, no, 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 you're not going there. You are, you are, you're, not, you are, you're only in, in grade one. Now you have to continue to study. And then the boy said, no, 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 mom, I want to go, I want to go. Okay, you can go for the summer. So the monk brought him, went with the boy to Tibet for the summer. And, and the boy was, a Caucasian, a boy was not a Chinese boy, <laughs> not a dependent boy. It was a white Caucasian boy from, a, from an Irish family, for example. And they were in, the mom and the boy were in Tibet, living in a temple. And then the disciples, the monk disciples, were trying to test the boy. Well, before the master passed away, the master monk passed away, he was using some, he was using a bowl that he'd been using for 50 years. He'd been using a rosary beads for 50 years. Certain, certain 
daily uh, uh, utensils that have been using. For example, a bowl, an eating bowl, the bowl that we can, the kind of bowl that we use. And then the disciples, the monk disciples, put a hundred bowls on the table, one of which is the master's bowl. The boy didn't know about it. The boy from New York didn't know about it. And then the boy was told to, do you like these bowls? The boy said, I love them. I love these bowls. Well, pick out the one that you like and we'll give it to you. So there's a hundred bowls. And the boy finally finished his pick. He picked up the bowl that belonged to the master among the 100 bowls. The probability of, the probability of choosing the right bowl that belonged to that, the, the, the master who passed away, the probability of picking up the right one out of 100 is one over 100. That is 1%, right? The probability of 1% how can that probability be high? So they thought that, oh, the, the master came back. The master is the living Buddha. The master is a living Buddha. He came back and they call him a living Buddha. Living Buddha does not mean that he's a, he's a living, he's, he's, he, he was a monk before and now he came back. Why, why did he come back, as, come back like that? He came back to promote the Buddhist teaching again, to promote compassion again, to do the same thing again, to, uh, to benefit all sentient beings in the Buddhist teaching. He had, an, he had a mission. He had a mission to give compassion. He had a mission to help. He had a mission to change the world by promoting the Buddhist teaching in compassion and loving kindness and generosity, in sila, in vipassana, in samadhi. In, in, in Samatha, in the Buddhist teaching, in Sila, that's what we call a living Buddha. Okay, that's a living Buddha. And there was a movie about it. There was a movie about it many, many years ago, it could be about 25 years ago, it's called uh, The Little Buddha. If you, if you Google in, 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 the, in YouTube, then maybe you can rent that movie, The, the, the Little Buddha. And after that movie was out, it was a box office, they, 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 they make another movie and they call it Seven Years in Tibet. Yeah, have you seen that movie? Seven Years in Tibet by uh, um, Brad, Brad Pitt or something. Brad Pitt, right? Brad Pitt. Uh, and then after that, oh, it's a box office. They produce another movie that's called Kundun. After that, they produce a, a lot of movies. And I, re I remember that even before this, this uh, uh, Little Buddha, there was a movie, there were so many movies related to reincarnation that you should see. You, you, you Google in the YouTube and say, I want to see movies in reincarnation. There are a lot of them. One of the most enchanting ones, one, one, one of the ones I like, really, is the one called Ghosts. There was an early one. Patrick Swayze and Demi Moore. You see, I know the movies. <laughs> I'm not just a monk. I know something outside. So a uh, really good movie about reincarnation. And if you really want to know something more ancient about reincarnation, there's another movie that you may not know of, that I know, because I'm old enough. It's called Heaven Can Wait. The, the modern version of Heaven Can Wait was played by, uh, what is his name, um, Warren Beatty. And even before Warren Beatty, was the one, another movie was made in the 1950s. Uh, it's also called, I don't know if it's called Heaven Can Wait, I don't know. Uh, it's on the same, more or less the same script. The script is very important. And that's almost the same script. There was a script about, uh, uh, about on the on the old one, yeah, it's all more, more or less the same. It was there was one guy who who had an accident who passed away. One morning, by cycling in the tunnel, and he was so he was he just he, he just finished his it's his lesson on the coronet the you know music instrument, and he was so happy going home. He was 
you know, whistling and all that. He was, he was bicycling into a tunnel. He got crashed by a train. And then he went to heaven. And then a the guy upstairs, there was a guy upstairs looking at the computer and saying, hey, you, you're not due yet. How come you come here? At that time, 25 years ago, there was a computer checking into the lives of people. You're not due. No, I'm not due. Do you know what you're doing now? You are dead already. Do you know? No, I don't. I'm, am I dead? Yeah, you, you're dead. But I don't understand why you have come up here. You're not due yet. Can I come back? Oh, let me check. Let me check. He said, no, you can't come back. The computer said, your body was burned already. How can you come back? How can you go back to your body? Oh, what am I going to do? I miss my family. I'm going to go back. Oh, gee, I don't know what to do. Let's, let's check with my supervisor. So we went to the supervisor, Mr. Mr. Heaven or something like that. And then Mr. Heaven said, wow, let's put him in another body. <laughs> the same guy in another body. So... Accidentally, they put him in the body of a boxer. He was boxed out and dead, locked out, knocked out and dead. And then everybody start, thought he was dead, and then he got up again. Because that body of that coronet playing guy got into that boxer. And then there was another, and then after that boxer died, he got in another body, got in a few bodies, and everybody has, everybody has this different story. A story of greediness, a story of blindly looking for reputation, a story of murder, a story of broken marriage. Oh, many, many stories. So I want to suspend you by not telling you the stories. All right, okay? That's the first question. I have answered that question. Second question, today's Dharma talk was extremely powerful in the message. Do you think so? Do you think today's... <laughs> you see, sometimes I scratch my head and say, you know what happened to me? Uh, when I was talking, I found that this morning I was dumb in my language side of the brain. I can't, I can't really express myself well this morning. You may not realize. You know, I, I try hard to, to express my words. So sometimes it happens that way. Don't think that you are very eloquent. Sometimes just one day that, wow, I can't blow out my words. That's exactly what happened to me this morning. I was blowing out very slowly with difficulty. And then you said it was fantastic. <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> Extremely powerful. I thought it was terrible. <laughs> Where can I see the continuation of all these lectures if I'm not able to come next two weeks? Get into YouTube. I have hundreds of this. Get into YouTubes. Just key in Guan Chung or, or, or reference, R E V dot R E V Guan G U A N space 6 G N G. There's so many lectures in it Chinese lectures, Cantonese lectures, Man, uh, Putonghua lectures, and English lectures. And uh, I've been doing this YouTube lectures for, for many, many years. Uh, and some of them I, I like. Some of them I say, oh, I don't want to watch them again. <laughs> no, no way. So these are the questions. Next question. Could you explain the meaning of sleeping Buddha? Why is it called sleeping Buddha? It's not sleeping Buddha. It's reclining Buddha. When you say sleeping Buddha, there's a connotation in it that the Buddha goes to sleep. And when somebody goes to sleep, it's all confused. We're already in a dream, you're sleeping, you're another dream, you're a dream within a dream. It's, we're all confused. So that's not sleeping Buddha, that's a reclining Buddha. Why a reclining Buddha appear like that? Because in our mind, we always have wisdom in every thought, in the four moments, in every moment of our life. In every moment of, of our life, we must be calm, we must have serenity and calmness of mind in every moment of our life. How many moments are there, just to generalize it? How many moments of our, how many moments, if you say moment in life? Walking, right? Walking, sleeping, 
sitting and standing. Xin zu zuo wo. All these moments include every second of our life. So we're not excluding a reclining Buddha. When you are reclining, you should be sober. When you are reclining, you, you should have serenity of mind. When you are reclining, sleep, even when you are sleeping, you must be very clear, very calm in your mind. That's, that's a symbol of showing every moment of your life, you should have that calmness. You should have that wisdom in every moment of your life.